Weeks' voice was barely audible when he told the judge he wants to die for the crime he still denies committing and says if authorities can find the murderer, he'd like to be set free. If not, Weeks says he wants to get the same thing Bats got. Judge Bird agreed with Weeks' request to die as soon as possible, setting an execution date before sunrise July 30th. But the capital murder conviction is automatically reviewed by the state Supreme Court. One of the key issues the defense will present is an incident yesterday when the state's key witness, Jewel Martin, rode to the courthouse with two other jurors. Prosecuting attorney well, Mitch Gavin says Ms. he Martin doesn't think the judge's decision the denying a motion a for a mistrial will come back to haunt no, the state. No, ma'am, I do not. The judge brought both of the jurors that were allegedly involved in that and asked them whether or not there was any conversations concerning the case with Ms. Martin, and they both indicated there was no conversation concerning the case whatsoever. But court-appointed defense attorney law, Jack Smith says that will be a key appeal. issue on appeal. And of course, it's a very pertinent point, among other points, that will be raised at the appropriate time within that appeal process shall be, of course, the motion for the mistrial and all of its dictates and, and merits accordingly. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News in Tuskegee. Sure, it will be. Um, it's Investment Act of 1958. It broke on its purpose and failed communities by stealing. We're encouraging building owners and shopkeepers to consider now is uh, basically a fairly low cost approach to making the building work for them the best that it can, taking advantage of the architectural features that the building has to offer. As soon as the morning rush hour was over, they filed out of a park just across the Potomac in Virginia. They had one more river to cross. Well, all of this is symbolic, and unless the people on the hill get the message, it doesn't mean a thing. They'd won a big victory while they were marching when the Senate shattered a filibuster and passed the Voting Rights Act. Along their way, these marchers had stopped to register people to vote in the small towns of Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolinas. We did very well. In each state that we went into, we were able to get a lot of individuals who were not registered registered, and we encouraged a lot of those who already registered but who did not vote to turn out to vote. But voting rights was not the only purpose of their march. We're also trying to demonstrate to the Congress and to our president that balancing the budgets on the backs of poor people is not what America is all about. God, who has brought us thus far along the way. Yeah. Oh, we yeah. thank you, you brought us safely through Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. And with a prayer, they had crossed the last river on their way. Yeah. Yeah. Into the land of the capital of our nation. Yeah. Yeah. Don Brownlee, WSFA TV News, on the 14th Street Bridge in Washington. Thank School you, administrators and supervisors in Montgomery for their annual convention invited the candidates to speak for 15 minutes each. House Speaker Joe McCorkadale says the state needs a governor who's familiar with the legislative process. He says if a better friend to education can be found than him, they'll withdraw from the race. Montgomery Mayor Emory Farmer was next, advocating full implementation of the statewide kindergarten program. Farmer, the only Republican candidate at the forum, says more money for education will come as the economy improves. Birmingham businessman Frank Thomas Jr. wants the state board of education to go back to being appointed that way he says the AEA will not be able to control the board he also predicts proration in next year's education budget lieutenant governor George McMillan's in favor of using some of the oil and gas windfall lease money for a fund to match local support for education McMillan says this will give local boards of education incentive to increase funding for education former governor George Wallace highlighted his role in establishing junior colleges and tech schools in his previous term he also advocated further industrial development as a way to put Alabamians back to work. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News. 
The governor's announcement that he has qualification papers came on the heels of a fairly successful day for his legislative package. His voluntary school prayer bill passed the Senate and moved out of a House committee, and his retirement reform measure crossed a major hurdle as it was narrowly approved in the House Budget Committee. But the governor wouldn't commit to run for re-election. I tell you folks, the state of Alabama are paying for $40 million worth of state government that is wrong. That's a job I came here to finish. I want to finish it, and I want to finish it uh, this year. But I have insurance policy that uh, uh, if I have a problem, I have an insurance policy. The governor was particularly pleased as he watched a 7-7 tie on his retirement reform measure turn into an 8-6 approval by the House Ways and Means Committee. These eight members voted this bill out in spite of threats from AEA to run people against them, from threats to organize support against them, from threats to give the opposition money in the full face of those threats those special interest threats, these eight men voted that bill out in an election year. That Emotions throughout the Capitol were very high as friction briefly erupted between a member of the governor's staff and an AEA-backed legislator on the House floor. There was friction between the governor and a member of the House Judiciary Committee as that committee approved the House version of the public school prayer bill. And there when they got to pray, to and how they the got to pray. Senate version of the prayer bill now, I want to ask you to adopt this the substitute as the governor's textbook committee bill was approved by a Senate Education Committee, but not addressed yet by the House Education Committee. I think we need to ask why. I don't understand why Representative Pete Turnham from Lee County, of all places, would be dragging his feet on the textbook committee. It is a major issue. Move Complications of time are growing as the House and Senate continue to run on different meeting schedules, which is consuming legislative days, even through the weekend when neither House is expected to meet. The emotions and complications have only doubled the fury with which the governor is campaigning for his reforms. The governor says he'll be back out on the road in northwest Alabama this week. And the governor says if his reforms are defeated, he'll personally campaign against those legislators who vote against his legislative package. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Several years ago, when the downtown stores opened on Saturday mornings, shoppers drove many miles to spend their hard-earned dollars. Now, shoppers are driving to the more convenient malls, taking the money away from downtown businesses. But the National Main Street Center is working with four Alabama cities in an experiment to revitalize its downtown businesses, bringing back shoppers and capital. Director Dwight Young says cities nationwide are receptive to the project. It's, it's in their own interest, obviously, to get properties back on the tax rolls, um, to get people back supporting uh, the government and the businesses that still exist downtown, to get people back living downtown, to cut down street crime and all of those sorts of things. So we're finding them very receptive. Young says money? fixing up older historic buildings, mainly in smaller cities, isn't very costly and is a good investment to attract the once loyal crowd. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News in Selma. as to a number of the elements of rate base. There is, however, a wide and deep for Alabama gas rate case, who said you should not use the case had advocated and that you, the commission, had endorsed, and which the Attorney General's witness has proposed to you, and which they should not have a negative working capital of $8 million. It is absolutely ridiculous. It may be as low. To rule on them again, go to a balance sheet this time. It's simply. The educators invited the candidates to be a part of their 12th annual convention. Each candidate was given 15 minutes to speak and answer questions. House Speaker Joe McCorkadale led Alabama, off by saying he'd quit the governor's race if anyone could find be a better friend to education than he is. McCorkadale says the state needs a governor familiar with the way the legislature works. Montgomery Mayor Emory Farmer says the state should use some of the oil and gas lease money to fully implement the statewide kindergarten program. Farmer also advocates a return to discipline in the classroom. Birmingham businessman Frank Thomas Jr. predicts proration in the Education Trust Fund next year. He says cooperation between public education and private industry will lower Alabama's unemployment rate. Lieutenant Governor George McMillan wants to encourage more local support for education. 
education by Quality using money from the oil and gas in the state leases of Alabama to establish a matching program with local boards, on public education. according to McMillan. And it disturbs me that rather than this message being projected by Governor George Wallace, I said, says he's been a friend of education, education in Alabama, will be the and will make education his priority of state government when I become again. the governor. He also told of his past successes in industrial development and how that's the way to put Alabamians back to work. He has like today WSFA is TV news. that many members of the legislature... Rumors that Governor James intended to qualify for re-election erupted like wildfire around noon. At 2 o'clock, he admitted his office had asked for qualification papers, but he said they were only insurance should his reform issues not be passed. The governor remained very vague about the implications and steered his talk toward the current legislative package. His retirement reform measure cleared a major obstacle when the House Ways and Means Committee narrowly approved the measure. The Senate Budget Committee is expected to act on the retirement measure tomorrow morning. The governor's voluntary public school prayer bill was passed by the Senate, but there were several heated moments as some members unsuccessfully tried to alter the bill to remove the prescribed prayer but leave a voluntary prayer measure. The House version of the prayer bill moved out of committee this morning with Governor James, his son Bob James III, and First Lady Bobby James personally supporting the measure. The governor's textbook committee bill moved out of a Senate committee, but has yet to be considered by the House Education Committee. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. What are the plans? Cancel the paper? Oh, one last stop before I head to the beach. I may take a few days off, but the need for blood never takes a vacation. Accident victims can't wait until I return. They need my blood now. So I've come to the Red Cross to lend a hand. It's easy, only takes about 10 minutes. I've given for you, please give for others. Before you go on vacation, donate blood because you never know when you'll need that gift of life. Martin, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Miller, Mr. Mitchum. the Administrator of General Services, Washington, D.C., the President of the City to speak like we're the right button to get telephone numbers. Um, all right, gentlemen, you know, City Bill 63 on page 12. Yes. All right, y'all, this is a bill that Senator Kirkland. Baxley says when a neighbor accused him of being a Democrat only because his daddy was a Democrat and because of what his daddy taught him, Baxley told him he was right. Baxley says his daddy taught him that everyone should be treated equally with respect and that everyone has the right to exert his rights as guaranteed under the Constitution. Baxley says the Democratic Party expresses those ideals. But ideals aside, Baxley says the Democratic Party doesn't have to take a back seat to any party in expressing patriotism. We go a step further than that. We say it's not enough to just be strong militarily. We've got to be strong in the sense that we are going to develop a country, a society, where people from the time they're born are guaranteed the right to go just as far as they can go, limited only by their own lack of ability or lack of initiative. Although the topic of Baxley's speech was the Democratic Party, he couldn't resist the opportunity to ask for support in his bid to be the state's next lieutenant governor. I hope that I can use whatever clout the presiding officer has to see that the budgets, regardless of what's in them, that they're debated early and that they're voted on early. 
so we can stop this kind of game playing that they've had up there for decades and decades of passing the budget in the wee hours of the last night when you pass a billion dollar budget and nobody knows what's in it for weeks thereafter. Baxley faces State Representative Sonny Callahan in the Democratic primary. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. We think really it was just a case of his playing possum murder this morning because he was in his bed at 1.30 and a half hour later for a head count he wasn't there. And uh, we immediately brought in the dogs from up here in Draper and searched the area with the dogs and our officers and local law enforcement officers in the Ellick City area, but uh, we didn't have any luck. Did you once again if the members of today's forum audience were confused about who was running for selected state offices, there should have been little doubt left when the meeting broke up. There were candidates for the state commissioner of agriculture and industries, Supreme Court candidates, a lone candidate for attorney general, as well as candidates for lieutenant governor and governor. The ground rules for the forum were clear. Candidates would have about 10 minutes to make a speech, which would be followed up by five minutes of question and answers. Moderator of the forum, Bo Renfro, says the purpose of the meeting was simple. Trying to help create a good climate in the state of Alabama so that Alabama can go ahead and develop like the other Sun Belt states have developed and gotten a little bit ahead of us, I'm afraid. So we're trying to become active in government that affects the well-being of business so that we can enhance development in the state of Alabama. So I guess this would be a very important uh, time for a candidate that he should put his best foot forward if he's uh, seeking to get some kind of backing from the business and professional organizations today. I don't think he could have a more important forum in which to state his views. Under the rules, reporters were allowed into the meeting room to hear candidates, but cameras were barred except for photo opportunities. Organizers wanted the candidates to speak to the audience without being inhibited by cameras. Although the candidates for governor spoke on a variety of subjects, there seemed to be several reoccurring points that were brought out, such as creation of a healthy business environment in the state, more jobs, better schools and education, and reorganization of the Alabama Development Office to attract more industry into the state. Of the 19 candidates invited to speak today, all were there except for gubernatorial candidate Big Jim Folsom. Several of the candidates said this forum was more important to them than the audience, the businessmen and businesswomen, because in a relatively short amount of time they could convey their message to a large cross-section of business in Alabama. As far as the businessmen and businesswomen are concerned, most said they would reserve their judgment. They would not make a snap decision on just one appearance at a forum. They said that decision will come later on down the road. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. Under this new system, we have eliminated the tag lines and through our mail system as well. Then, uh, for the next six years, we are planning uh, to put in the most modern uh, new system in our record room and also another substation in South Montgomery County. Well, as you know, our record room. What about your opposition to the budget? Are you worried at this point? Uh, anytime you got opposition, you work hard. We have eliminated the tag lines and through our mail system as well. Then uh, we have. <laughs> I also created the first licensed annex office in East Montgomery. I will continue to work hard for the people of this county and continue to do the very best possible. Uh, I was appointed the first time for two years. Then I ran under this new system, we have eliminated the tag lines and through our mail system as well. Then uh, we have. Baxley refused to answer questions about issues facing the legislature, such as prayer in schools or retirement for teachers and state employees, because he says the lieutenant governor has to be impartial. He says it doesn't matter where he stands on an issue. On the subject of the Democratic Party, however, Baxley is a little more opinionated. The last good Republican president that we've had was Lincoln. 
And I think he was the first. <laughs> and the Republican Party, uh, they, they have been the party of, of special interest and privilege through the years. They are today, and they will be tomorrow. I'm a Democrat not just in this election. I'm going to be a Democrat whether I win or lose the primary. I'm going to support the ticket. I'm going to support the nominee of the Democratic Party nationally two years from now. And I'm going to be doing it for years to come, whether it's in office or as a private citizen. Baxley faces State Senator Sonny Callahan in the Democratic primary. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. Through our mail system as well, then uh, we have, we're real. <laughs> we have eliminated the tag lines with a one stop operation and have made a model record keeping system that have been viewed and studied and copied by others. Montgomery. You don't have to be very old to remember when the initials AEA brought to mind nothing more than a holiday from school. Today, when you mention AEA, most people think of the most powerful political lobby in the state. And the man most responsible for this change is Paul Ray Hubbard, for 13 turbulent years, the executive secretary of the Alabama Education Association. Paul Hubbard was born on Christmas Day, some might say appropriately, in 1935. His place of birth, the rural community of Hubbardville in Fayette County. And in case you wonder, yes, Hubbardville was named for his family. This baby picture of little Paul Ray suggests that even in diapers, he could give the signal to vote no by the expression on his face. Here he is as a three-year-old, and when he entered the first grade, he wore the standard uniform of all youngsters of that time and place, a pair of Tomcat overalls. When he graduated from high school in 1954, Hubbard's goal was to become a lawyer, but he couldn't afford to go to law school. He decided to get a college degree, teach school for a few years, and then study law. He attended Florence State University, and as evidenced by this picture, he was quite a dude, sitting astride a Pontiac, dressed in his white blazer, blue slacks, and argyle socks. He was what they call in that neck of the woods a dirt road sport. Once Hubbard began teaching, he forgot all about being a lawyer. Several years later, he returned to college, earning his master's and doctorate degrees from the University of Alabama. He then went into education administration and was superintendent of the Troy City Schools when he was named head of the AEA in 1969. What he's done with the AEA in the ensuing years is well documented. He has converted the 40,000 member organization into a gung-ho group of political activists. The AEA's political action committee, AVOTE, has had remarkable success, especially in legislative races. And this success has been translated into a steady stream of victories for the AEA in the chambers of the House and the Senate. Today at 46, the handsome, articulate, and very tough Dr. Hubbard is firmly established as one of the most politically influential figures in the state. It should come as no surprise that Dr. Hubbard's wife, Margaret Ann, is also a teacher and a card-carrying member of the AEA. They have two daughters, one in med school, the other in high school. And they are active members of the Church of Christ. Dr. Paul Ray Hubbard, call him what you like, and he's been called many things, but most assuredly, he's a very interesting person. any brass bands or red carpet drove out for the return of the 18th Band and two jets and the crews. 
there really didn't need to be any. Because the men and machines have performed better than good. The group knew it was number one, and it showed. During the evaluation at Gulfport, inspectors awarded the Danley Base Group the highest rating ever achieved by any Air Force reconnaissance unit under current standards. During the two-week inspection, the group was rated on how well they could mobilize personnel and machines to Gulfport. Once in Gulfport, they managed to reconnaissance missions and develop information that could be taken under simulated combat conditions. Ground crews were also tested on security, having to defend the base and aircraft against attacks from hostile ground forces and terrorists. Group Commander of the 187th Colonel William Turnipseed says the exercises in Gulfport combined with other outstanding ratings proves that the Danley unit is the best in the nation. After 30 years of service and aerial reconnaissance, the 187th will begin converting to a new mission as a combat unit. The 18 RF-4Cs will be dispersed to other National Guard units and the Danley group will receive the F-4D fighters. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. <laughs> I want to tell you a story that happened to me about four years. Uh, we're going to look at that insanity and trust within our community. What is a person with 18 prior felony convictions for burglary going to do when he gets responsibility and trust? We don't have anybody in our presence that was sent there for singing too loud in church. They are dangerous, violent, repeat offenders. They're individuals that, when they're put in jail, ought to remain in jail. I happen to come from the old school. When somebody commits a crime that deserves penitentiary punishment, that's what it ought to be, punishment. And he ought to be put behind bars and punished and kept there for an appropriate amount of time for the crime he's committed. No federal judge in this country should have the authority to come open the door and let them go. ...turns and some problems, but often one or two failures along the way will help them on the way to success. I think that your goals have to be set very high and the goals very clear and your steps to those goals very definitive. And I think that any woman has to realize as you're going into business that it is not easy, that it takes lots of hard work. You know, the average small business person getting started spends anywhere from 55 to 80 hours a week. But once you've achieved those initial goals, then it becomes much easier on the way up. They can set their goals high and their sights high and believe that they want to move forward on that road to excellence. Realize there may be some downturns and some problems, but often one or two phases. Of the House to the Administrator of General Services, Washington, D.C., the President of the Senate, speak like we have the right Uh, the only problem that uh, we're running into is that uh, the Senate doesn't want to vote and the House is glad of it. Uh, nobody wants to face these issues in an election year. Uh, and that may necessitate us having to call another special session uh, either right before qualifying time is over or right after qualifying time expires. Graddick was asked by Dale County Tax Assessor Kurt Head if counties have to stick to the October 1st, 1980 reassessment date. Uh, we said that uh, it would, would not solely be uh, contingent upon the October 1, 1980 reassessment figure that, that the Board of Equalization could take into consideration any factors that had changed in between October 1, 80 and October 1, 1981. The Attorney General also says county boards of equalization have the final administrative say-so over the appraisal of land and buildings. 
Title 40, Section 211, places the duties of equalization. Uh, well, just let me read it to you. It says that the Revenue Department shall have and exercise general and complete supervision and control the valuation, equalization, and assessment of property in the state of Alabama. Egerton says the October 1st, 1980 reassessment date he ordered is now part of a federal court order. Commissioner Egerton says to ensure compliance with the federal court, he's considering filing papers next week, making all county boards of equalization a party to the federal court order on property reappraisal. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. Realize there may be some downturns and some problems. I never consider myself being a woman. I think what's so important is that people are considered professionals and that people understand what qualities it takes to succeed. And again, it goes back to the basic goals. But I think if we get hung up on considering whether you're men versus women, we're not going to succeed. There may be some downturns and some problems but often one or two failures along the way will help them on the way to success. And if they really keep a positive attitude, so much about that positive mental attitude, while they're learning and gaining the experience. Yes, sir. You said you're gonna be objective. Death penalty law in Alabama. And I won't. Anybody who lies and cheats to steal the taxpayer's money who is not eligible to be on our welfare rolls is sooner or later going to become acquainted with one of my prosecutors. And they have a 100% conviction rate. Now, the deterrent effect of the welfare program in Alabama today, I don't think can be measured, except for the fact that every time we go into a community, every time people are prosecuted and successfully prosecuted for stealing welfare benefits, the very next day and several days thereafter at the local departments of pensions and security, they line up and the telephone rings off the wall for people revo removing themselves voluntarily for being on welfare. I was glad that he resigned, and I want to speak about the man that's taken his place. I happen to know him personally. He's a businessman. He's a man of compassion. He's a man of concern, and he's tough. But he understands this country, and he understands this country's needs and his people. I feel very good about Mr. Haig's successor. The auction officially started this morning at 10 o'clock. At 15 till, the street in front of Bama near the eastern bypass was filled with cars. Inside, about 250 people crowded into hallways, offices, and the big auto repair shop to await the beginning of the end for Bama. We want everything out of here by Monday. The sale was conducted by First Alabama Bank. 
the terms were cash. All right, we're going to start in there with the office equipment. There were adding machines, yeah. typewriters, pictures, televisions, auto repair equipment, and cars. Over $1 million worth, according to the general manager and vice president of Bama, Manny Messager. We uh, opened up a dealership with big hopes, and uh, I guess the foreign car market or some of the other car market went down in this area. Uh, we were not uh, doing it what we expected to do. And we got together with the other partners in the corporation, and we decided it was best uh, because of business and uh, the way that uh, the economy was to just close down and uh, have a liquidation and uh, just move on to some other area and try to buy another dealership. Uh, we worked it out with First Alabama. We made an agreement with them. And uh, we're just going to liquidate, sell everything out, pay the bank, pay everybody, and uh, just go on to another area and see if we can make a go. It's, uh, Messenger I, says I, I, he I, thinks Bama is just one of thousands of car dealerships to shut down in the past six months. Messenger says all the proceeds of the auction will go to First Alabama Bank. Rather than file bankruptcy or start something that would be in, uh, not probably in the best interest of the community, we heard that somebody else that went under had cars that weren't fixed and it made it bad for everybody. We just decided to close the door and uh, liquidate and go from there. Messenger says he's not sure if he'll try to start another car dealership very soon. He says the car market just isn't doing well. Messenger says the loss of Bama is disappointing, not so much because the business is gone, but because the business allowed him to make a lot of friends. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. The purpose of the Hugh O'Brien Youth Foundation is to recognize outstanding high school sophomore students from around Alabama and to bring them together with a group of business leaders and education leaders and expose them to how our American free enterprise incentive system works. They have the opportunity to ask direct questions to business and government and education leaders and to also have rap sessions with these leaders in small groups. The astronauts have now been in bed for about three hours. During the night, Kennedy officials will keep a constant check on the shuttle systems before Mattingly and Hartsfield are waked at 5.30 Central Time for their bacon and eggs breakfast. The critical preparations begin tomorrow morning as fuel is loaded on board, control systems are pressurized, and last-minute inspections completed. Mattingly and Hartsfield will board the Columbia about two hours before liftoff. Thunderstorms this afternoon pelted the Columbia briefly but haven't delayed the countdown. Weather reports as of this evening indicate some continuing scattered thunderstorms in northern Florida, but they aren't expected to cause any problems for tomorrow's 10 a.m. Central Time launch. The forecast for the Kennedy Space Center calls for scattered clouds and 85 degrees tomorrow. All during the day, the highways around the Space Center have been crowded with campers and motorhomes ready to spend the night and watch the launch from eight or more miles away. A contingency of Auburn University officials and alumni have moved in to cheer the two Auburn graduates into space. At the Kennedy Space Center, Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. At 8 o'clock this morning, about 150 news media representatives from around the world watched one of the major activities leading up to the launch, the rollback of the shuttle support structure. This morning, the astronauts had breakfast with a delegation of dignitaries, including acting dean of Auburn University's engineering school, Chester Carroll and Auburn alumnus Dick Smith,
who's also the director of the Kennedy Space Center. Later, Mattingly and Hartsfield took their last practice flights in two types of specially designed jet aircraft. One simulates the handling of controls on board the space shuttle Columbia. Tomorrow morning, the astronauts will get up about 6.30, eat breakfast, get their last medical checks and weather briefings before liftoff. And if all goes as planned, the fourth and final test flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia will blast Hartsfield and Mattingly into Earth orbit for their seven-day mission. This is Bob Howell, WSFA-TV News at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida.